you know, a, a lot of young guys don't have the experience. They don't know what to do during a match when something goes wrong. Nash and Foley obviously do, and I give them a lot of credit for being able to even finish the match, much much less make it good. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would be unmuted. inclined to agree. Uh, I'd be inclined to agree. And a guy who's seen his share of bloodbaths in his days uh, came from one of the most violent wrestling promotions we've seen on the continental United States, and that is uh, the ring announcer right here with us on the line, Mr. Chris Class. Chris, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much for having me, fellas. All righty. Well, I mean, if there was ever a hardcore promotion in the United States, it had to be, you think of two things. You think of ECW and XPW, and for a while there, you guys were going at it. So tell us what your, what you, what have you been up to lately? And I hear rumblings that this Saturday night we're going to get a return back to extreme uh, XPW wrestling. No, I'm sorry. You were wrong about that. I am wrong. Sorry. It's actually this Saturday afternoon. Oh, I'm wrong. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's, it's going to be pretty big. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of buzz around town about it. It's actually a pretty big weekend uh, for wrestling, period, in, in Los Angeles, of course, with SummerSlam coming on Sunday at Staples Center. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we're the, the, the day before at 2 p.m., uh, it's going to be at a place called The Arena in Hollywood. It's on Santa Monica Boulevard in Highland. And uh, it is going to be the 10-year anniversary. Uh, XPW, for those of you that don't know, started back in 1999 in July on July 31st, uh, right here in SoCal in L.A. And, uh, yeah, we did. We had, a, we, we had a very good, a, a very interesting and crazy run uh, uh, for a while there, we had a reunion show actually early last year. Yep. Uh, Cold Day in Hell. Cold Day in Hell, which is on DVD, it was distributed worldwide and all that. And uh, you know, I, I mean, pretty much everything anything on DVD now you get anywhere anyway. But uh, uh, it was uh, it was a big success. So we we said, well, you know what? We got a ten year. You realize it's ten years uh, since I now let's have a ten year reunion show. And, and uh, people said. Buzz started getting on the internet, and uh, uh, so uh, you know we're looking forward to it. It should, should be a lot of fun, and uh, and uh, again, it's just going to be a big weekend out here uh, coming up. And uh, I, I did the uh, play-by-play announcing along with uh, Larry Rivera, who Larry he, Rivera, yep. He only he only lasted up till I want to say 2001. Yep, yeah. Uh, conflict of interest with him, but then I. Uh, Kind of took the reins. By my, well, then the, then another guy came in, Juan Tastico, yeah. uh, the player Rivera, and then and then I just kind of did it on my own. And then I actually teamed up for a little while with Joey Styles. Uh, he was in there for for a brief stint, um, which I'm still good friends with. And um, and uh, and then and then it basically uh, it basically went from officially went from '99 to 2004. Right. And then it was sold off to uh, Big Vision Entertainment, who has has owned it ever since uh, the buy off. So, and then Big Vision now is responsible uh, for these uh, reunion shows uh, happening. I mean, one of the big things, though. I mean, the video distribution of XPW has been one of the best uh, selling points of it because if you lived on the East Coast or even out here in Arizona, we really didn't get the TV show that much, but we did get the DVDs, and the DVDs were absolutely incredible. I mean, you guys. And you also sold it right to the right audience. I remember uh, the big selling point was that, you know, if you got this DVD, you get to see Major Guns get spanked. (laughs) Oh, bingo. You know, that's going to sell. So, uh, I mean, you guys really, you were out there for a promotion, and and you were doing all the right things. Uh, Can you believe it's been 10 years since you got started? Absolutely not. I can't believe it. It it seems like... From 2009 back to 1999 went so much quicker than from 1999 to 1989. I mean, of course, when you get older, time goes by faster. But uh, I can't believe it. It's uh, it's it it you know a lot of, a lot of the feedback from the fans out there, are, you know, on the message boards and all that. A lot of them are saying the same thing. Like, man, I remember when I was at the first XPW show in Reseda, which is in L.A. Uh, in the San Fernando Valley of in L.A. city of L.A. But uh, yeah, I remember back in 1999 going to the first show and all the, you know, all these stars came in, Big Dick Dudley, John Cronus, Pitbull, 
Public Enemy, and then and then that that's when we developed our talent, which was like guys like Homeless Jimmy, Supreme, Jimmy, Supreme. Uh, yep. Chaos, The Messiah, uh, White Trash, Johnny Webb. Uh, you know, the, it just uh, it, it 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 blossomed into something. Well, I mean, we needed the the established stars to make our stars big because the, the thing is, nobody would have watched it um, had there not been anybody that familiar, and we never would have really would have gotten on television. So, so that's that's where all that came from. And I know we always got criticized for uh, being an ECW knockoff. I'm not saying we that's not 100 percent of the truth, but there was a big reason why we had to bring these guys in if we wanted to be successful on, on, a, on, a, on a major television level, not to say that we were by any means big as WWE, 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 But to get to that level, you, you, did, you, did, you needed star power, you know, to, to start yourself off, you know. Right, right. Now, how did you mention that, that the comparison between you guys and ECW, and there was a little bit of a rivalry, it kind of bottled over at the heat wave pay-per-view in uh, 2000 for ECW, and yeah, did you feel that the the competitive the east side west side battle that the internet tried to create? You feel that was ever legitimate, or do you think that that was all just a whole lot of uh, wrestling fans trying to create something where there wasn't anything? Well, you know that, that that's a that's a good question because it's a lot different now. I mean, the wrestling industry back in the late mid to late nineties into the early two thousands kind of got bombarded itself by the internet, uh, when the internet buzz really took off and, and the fans started voicing their own views and their own opinions, I think the wrestling industry, it took a while for them to adapt and to um, evolve themselves into this world we live in now with the internet and with people voicing their opinions. Uh, so in, 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 that, in that growth, in, in, with those growing pains came things that the wrestling community, industry would react to the internet were some nowadays they've kind of been, they've kind of been there done that they they know how to handle these things more uh just they they're more prepared for it and i think back then you know i i think uh, some of these things uh the the pro wrestling industry did react to the internet whereas again to say they wouldn't do it now they're they're again more prepared for it but uh, a lot a lot, big part of that uh, the heat wave incident really came from uh, the, the old owner of XPW, Rob Black. He had a history with Paul Heyman, and uh, I think I think really the main and one and only reason that I know of to this day is why that whole thing happened was because it was simply in in Rob Black's mind. Well, these guys are coming to Los Angeles. These guys are coming to our hometown. These guys have been in Philly and New York in their own two places forever, and now they happen to be coming to another city, and it just happens to be L.A., and it happens to be where we're, uh, at the time, XPW was running very successful shows at the L.A. Sports Arena. And uh, and then they came into the Grand Olympic Auditorium, which both are downtown L.A. and pretty big venues. So that was basically it. He just wanted to make a statement saying, like, uh, you know, d- don't try to we got something going, we got some momentum, and, and I think in his mind, he thought ECW was just coming in to basically try to kill that as much as possible and to basically keep themselves established from coast to coast as the one and only, you know, extreme wrestling company out there. Now, from your from your opinion, did that help or hinder uh, XPW, or did that not have any effect whatsoever? No, I, I think... I think in the long run it probably didn't have an effect because people were going to watch it or not watch it regardless. I think in the short term it definitely had a good effect because people were talking about that moment. People were talking about that incident. In turn, people were talking about XPW. Any press is good press. I mean, let's face it, whether you're in wrestling and show business, whatever – uh, and he presses good press, so uh, it definitely helped. I mean, the very next show we did was at the LA Sports Arena a couple weeks later, and it was the Go Funk Yourself show. It was yep. Sabu yep. versus Terry Funk, and uh, Supreme versus Messiah, uh, Ka- Chaos versus Tracy Smothers. Uh, really, it was a good card, 
And uh, it was our biggest crowd at that point. There's something like what four or five thousand people there. Oh, wow. I, I might be I might be off a little bit, but um, I mean, what I mean is it could be a little more, it could be a little less. I I don't remember, but it was a it was a big crowd. And uh, I mean, and again, that's back in the year 2002 when wrestling crowds were a lot bigger, you know. But um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, again, it was like yeah, you know. I remember I remember when. Uh, I think it was either Rob Black or Josh Lazy, who was managing Sabu, came out in the ring and said, you know, I know it's not really cool or hip right now to be an XPW fan because of what happened in recent times. So you guys are truly the most hardcore motherfuckers out there. You can leave all those Internet nerds at home uh, talking crap. Uh, you know, so so there definitely was a uh, a buzz going around that it wasn't cool what we did and all that. But at the same time, there were so many, there were so many stages uh, there were so many, which no one knew at the time, but there were so many states like, oh, this league is coming in to invade. Uh, you know, remember when ECW would come into Raw and invade back in the late 90s? And, and then they'd have all these invasions, and people were like, oh, this is so cool, you know. But then when it happened for real, people were like, oh, no, this isn't cool. So it was kind of like, I guess in a way, we shot ourselves in the foot uh, because that kind of surprised me also. Just as a fan, like, I didn't understand why people didn't, uh, embrace that. It was almost like, oh, this is getting a little too real for me. Uh, no, no, no. You know, I got to back off for these stage invasions. It was like, yeah, I run gate league. All right, number one. You know, and, and then this happened for real. I was kind of in shock that, wow, why aren't people embracing this? Like, they, they kind of backed away. Like, this is too much. It's too scary. Whatever. I, I don't know. But, but, but when I say we shot ourselves in the foot, yeah, there was some negative uh, feedback. But, but in the long run. Uh, again, any press is good press, and I think it was possible. Now, I would tend to agree with that. Now, XPW went through some highs and some lows, and uh, I think we all know about those. And creatively, I think you guys really hit your stride. Creatively, I would say 2003, I really was a fan of what Shane Douglas was booking and bringing to the table to you guys. Uh, that said... It seemed like the popularity was then at that stage starting to dwindle, and obviously in 2004 you guys uh, packed it in at that point. Uh, do you think that it was a trickle-down effect because wrestling across the board had, had subsided in popularity, or what was the real reason behind the, re the slide of XPW's growth in popularity? Well, um, I mean, to me, I actually like I, – I, 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 I share a different opinion. I, I kind of thought creatively – our best times were right around the 2001 time when, when uh, we were more so focused on storylines with the local guys like Chaos, Homeless Jimmy, etc. Uh, I remember like there was a there was a whole story where where it explained how Homeless Jimmy became homeless in the first place. You know they he was going to school at UCLA and then the love of his life uh, we found uh, caught cheating and he was learn but he was learning so much learning about life and then after he learned about life and found her cheating he had to go live on the streets and the only way to forget about her was to uh to hunt and strive for food every day so he could get her out of his mind i mean it was just like stuff like that was i don't know i thought it was some we there was some well-written stuff and there was some horribly written stuff at the same time you know but uh but um you know, I, I think I think going back to your question, I think it has a lot to do with just the popularity of wrestling was was dwindling. The the, the heyday was gone in, in the entire industry. Like, uh, you know, you go back to the '80s, WrestleMania one, '85. I'd say like it kind of officially ended what like '92, yeah. and I'd say like like uh, it, it went from what 1997, 98. And I'd say what officially ended in what 2002, 2003. Yeah, I would say but, but, too. Yeah. Yeah, and then it kind of was just kind of like holding on a little bit in 03, and then like 04 on it was like a fish. But you know, uh, in that, and then you go, you look at you look at the shows that we did uh, in XPW w when when the era was hot, like when we debuted in 1999, and when our last show in 2003, 2004. Uh, 2003 was our last show uh, for for that era until we came back. But uh, for example, our first show, 1999, we had over a thousand people, and and it wasn't even a known league. But we just brought out Big Dick Dudley, 
and John Cronus. That was it. And then, oh, my gosh, these guys are from ECW. These guys are going to be here in L.A. We get to see them wrestle. Boom, you had over 1,000 people there. Okay, let's, let's fast forward now to 2003. Um, on our last few shows in California, we had about the same crowd, about 1,000, 1,100 people. However, now we have Shane Douglas. We have Vic Grimes. We have Juventud Guerrero. We have Jerry Lynn. We have Shark Boy. We have uh, – um, uh, 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 psychosis. Um, you know, we have all these stars. Chris Candido, the late Chris Candido, God rest his soul. Yeah. We had all these soul uh, uh, stars, yeah. and and the, that you needed that much star power in 2003 to fill up a thousand people. Whereas in 1999, all we needed was Big Dick Dudley. That was it. I mean, that's that's how big wrestling was. In, in span of four years. So I think it had a lot to do with the, the wrestling industry at that time. Uh, so not, you know, do you think it's changed at all? Has it heated up at all again? Or, or are we still in the same spot? Because, I mean, if you look at the ratings, yeah. I mean, something that, that we do on this show a lot is analyze the ratings and then talk about, you know, what needs to happen and what, what changes things. And, I mean, obviously, anybody with a brain can look at WCW, WWE ratings head-to-head, and it's clear to me that the WCW fans did not become WWE fans. They just stopped watching. The ECW fans just seemed to stop watching. And it seemed to me that that was, the, obviously, the beginning of the end of, of it all. And right now, you know, we got TNA, but for the most part, we don't have any viable competition to WWE. And WWE is kind of, you know languishing on the 3.5 to 4.0 at the absolute best. It's, so it seems it's like it's fun. about the same. It's funny. I think it's, it's to me, it seems like, I mean, it's definitely nowhere near the level it was back in, let's say, the new generation era, back in like uh, late 93 to mid mid to late 96, that, that right. funk. I mean, it, right now, as, as bad as you may say it is, the ratings and all that, it's nowhere near it was at that point. Yet at the same time, it's nowhere near it was at the Attitude Era or the, um, you know, the Hogan days. Yeah, but, the rock, uh, and era. Rock, and, rock and Wrestling Connection. Yeah, rock and Wrestling Era. But, um, but at the same time, I think the company has evolved so well that when there are these slumps or these crunch times, the, the company kind of kind of know, knows how to stay plateaued in a way that it's micromanaged itself to kind of stay at this comfort level. You know what I mean? It's not, not nowhere in the depth of the valley that it was in, in the new generation time. It's kind of, again, like micromanaged itself to kind of stay at this safe haven, this plateau, that it's not too big, it's not too small, but at the same time, I think something big does need to happen. And I think whatever does happen will 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 come to a shock to all of us because that's the only thing that ever does change wrestling, like Hogan turning heel with the NWO or Austin starting to put up his middle finger or The Rock uh, morphing into what he did or DX doing the controversial stuff they did. It, 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 it's always something that is a total shock. And then once that shock happens, of course, you... you 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 um you try to live off of that the success of it but then again uh, that eventually will wear itself out is which everything has done back in the 80s the hogan success they they kept it going kept it going and then eventually it's going to wean off cuz it's the same old thing but when it first happened it was the biggest thing whereas when in the attitude there when all that stuff first happened it was great and then you want to build off the success of course it is a smart business move but that is going to eventually wear away until right. some new and big comes along what that is i don't know and i don't think anyone knows right now because that's just what it will be it'll be something new that that you can't predict what's going to happen otherwise it wouldn't be that thing that would change the business yeah i mean ironically i was just reading a, a, an article on sports illustrated just the other day they had an article of the top 12 heel to villain things on there and it's legitimate stories about how sports stars you know did something bad to become villains and they actually had and referenced Hulk Hogan's heel turn from 1996 as one of the wow. top uh, 12 heel turns of a sports star. That is awesome. That's I think that, that it was... here we are 13 years removed from it, and people are still talking about it. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, 
oh, right place, right time, I guess. I mean, I mean, not, not take anything away from Hulk Hogan, but I mean, why? You have to ask yourself then why? Why is that? Why? Why is that one guy still talked about? I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's it's like. Uh, you know, and again, Steve Austin is the is the most successful as far as merchandise and all that. But but I mean, I don't think, I just don't think you can still, even though Stone Cold maybe on paper maybe the most successful, I don't think he did what Hogan did for the business in in, in a in a entire nutshell. But you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what's what's going to change the business. I really don't know. But uh, something new has to happen. And and I was talking to a friend about this. And if you look at the uh, if you look at the uptime and the downtime, we're, we're actually due for it in the next year or so. And what I mean by that is from 1985, and we'll say, till like, let's say WrestleMania 8 was kind of the last big hurrah for Hogan, would you say? Yes, yes. It was well, in WWF, yeah. yeah. In WWF, right. And that's what I mean, that, that the rock and wrestling era, let's say that that was a good seven years right there. Then, And then there was a downtime between, let's say, 93 to 97, so that's four years, and then it – peaked up again from 1998 to, let's say, 2003. So that was a run of five years. So now, between 2003 to 2009, uh, <laughs> we're, we're due for the, the upswing right about now, if you want to go in chronological order on yeah. how the ups and downs went in the business. So we, we are due for one. However, again, let's go back, take it back to where the company is now versus the new generation time. It's not in that total funk and slump that it was then. Again, the company is, is so advanced now that it's kind of micromanaged itself, again, to this safe haven plateau that I, I, I'm almost afraid to say I hope they're not just totally content where they are now yeah. just to kind of keep where it's at. But, but uh, well, it's going to be a problem, though, is, is uh, you know, Vince taking over the entire industry, basically, you know, one man's uh... – Acquisition is another man's invasion. But, um, you know, when Vince took over and, and basically took over all the territories, that's when it first boomed the first time. And then in the mid-90s, you know, WCW becoming as good and as popular and as talked about as it was forced Vince to make a drastic move that personally I don't think he personally wanted to do but had to do in order to survive. Uh, and, and that was the Attitude Era. And bam, there you are right there. And, you know, that is what happened. And, and Again, through those times, you had companies like XPW, like WCW, like uh, ECW. You had other companies that were also fueling the fire. Uh, right now, we, we don't have much. <laughs> yeah, I know, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's like, sad. And I don't know what the I don't know what what it's going to take to to change something. And and I I, I think that a lot of uh, the what is going to take what it is going to take is an upstart company, uh, you know, and, and I don't, I just don't see TNA. It, they would have done it by now if they were going to be competitive. Yeah. They would have done it by now. They, they got Spike TV. Uh, they, they had, they got Kurt Angle they, and they got, you know, Booker T, Mick Foley, all these stars. And it just, when Christian was there, Kevin Nash, when he first came in, I just, to me, I don't know. I think it is the nostalgia of a big star jumping ship to another league. Is that just not a big deal anymore? Because we've seen it done with WCW, and and you know, since we've seen it done with that league, uh, it just it, we're not going to get excited about it anymore because oh, we we know what's going to happen. You know, we've seen it, we've been there, we've done that. Is that why? And 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 and, and again, it just seems like. It would have happened already with TNA, with all the star power, with them getting a major network. I feel that way a lot with them. And, and when they first started, they were, you know, the reason I got back into it because after WCW and ECW closed, I, you know, I'd pick up and this is not, you know, blowing smoke. I would buy the uh, the XPW DVDs and and order the WWE pay per views as bad as those may have been, just because I wanted to see wrestling, but I couldn't bring myself to watch WWE because I was angry at the time. Um, yeah. And now, you know, now, of course, I have to watch WWE, otherwise I just wouldn't be watching wrestling. So, you know, so <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's that position. Um, I wanted to talk to you. What is your experience uh, before wrestling in terms of uh, journalism, announcing, and, and what you did before XPW? Well, I mean, as far as college went, I have a communications degree, a bachelor's in communications. Uh, 
Um, but, I you know, prior, prior to, um, well, I did a lot of voiceover classes. I did a lot of improv. And, uh, and then I, my, my love always growing up, man, was, was pro wrestling. I've been a fan since, I mean, I remember watching, my dad was watching when Bob Backlund was the champion, you know, I mean, this was before Hogan. I was really little. Um, uh, but, but I remember like really getting into it in like the mid to late eighties, of course, you know, yeah. when, when it was cool to, to watch it. But, um, can I, can I ask you a question? How old are you? I am 33, my friend. 33. Okay. I'm about to turn 28 and I think for some reason I've, I think I was like morphed into a seven year old. Uh, I, I should have been born seven year old too soon, you know, too late. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. No, I hear you. Just, just from watching old videotapes growing up. I yeah. mean, people are. I, I mean, I associate more. I mean, even my wife is older than I am, so I, I kind of associate with that generation a little bit more. Not that it's a generation gap, you know what I mean? Oh, no, no, no. I, I remember as a kid, as a teenager, like, people would ask me, how the hell do you know about this stuff? Like, how old are you? I'm like, oh, yeah, I watch videotapes. So. Old wrestling tapes, like, oh, okay, where do you get those at? I'm like, oh, well, you know, you got to be a fan to know this stuff. But, uh, um, yeah, go, basically, uh, no, I started, uh, just doing VO classes out in LA and, uh, and then, and then I, I attended a, a small time pro wrestling show, which was called SCCW, Southern California Championship Wrestling. I remember going to the show, just being obnoxious and the guys, the promoters were, cause I kind of took the heat away from the, workers and this is something i learned later not to do you know because i was just a fan but uh but anyway i became the ring announcer for that league and and long story short that league eventually became xpw uh rob black uh was looking to form a league because he had a falling out with paul Heyman because he was actually working for ecw uh, and working with paul Heyman, not working for him but giving them porn girls with jasmine st Clair appearing on ecw tv and all that at right. the time and then uh if you know rob black uh, and then, you, of course, you know how Paul Heyman is. You, you will understand in a heartbeat why they couldn't get along. They were too similar, and they were just two, like, just two bulls that are too similar to, to kind of coexist together, you know. And uh, kind of like Jesse Ventura and Hulk Hogan, you know what I mean? It was just one of those things where just they, they, they would not see eye to eye ever. So that's when Rob was hell-bent to start his own fed. He went to a house show at the Arrowhead Pond of Anaheim and, we were passing out flyers for our SCCW show, and Kevin Kleinrock was running it at the time with Dynamite D, the late, great Dynamite D. And uh, the long story short, uh, Kevin and Rob got together in, in XPW's form, so I was promoted to play-by-play -play guy from there, and, uh, and the rest is history. We have over 130 TV episodes, uh, you know, about a, a couple dozen home video events, and um, and then now hopefully it'll keep on growing with the, the resurgence of XPW here. Now, how do you rank yourself as an announcer? Because one of the things oh, yeah. we've been talking as a uh, announcer here, as a, a radio show here, is the quality of announcing. And I'm sure we're going to talk about it later on because there was a couple incidents on on Bra that Michael Cole managed to drive me crazy and uh, pull my hair out and scream and yell at the TV. Well, you, 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 yeah. yeah, you mentioned you actually mentioned that to me, and I'm surprised I didn't catch that, but. Uh, this was this past Monday? Uh, there's been a couple of things. I mean, Michael, uh, okay. Cole, Michael Cole has the, uh, ref refuses to use the word power slam, uh, mm -hmm. refuses to use the word shooting star press. I mean, it seems like even, it's not even just the finishers he's not calling anymore. He's just not calling anything. Uh, well, I've, I've, I've flubbed before too, so I'm not going to talk too bad, but, uh, no, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. You wanted to continue your question. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, how do you rank yourself as a as an? Well, I, I will say this. I, I'm I'm definitely not going to grow. I don't believe I'm the greatest announcer. Uh, 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 period. But I I will say this. Uh, this is not gloating at all. I I just think that when I first started, I was uh, the shits compared to now. So I think I definitely improved uh, with time and and you know from just getting feedback from, uh, you know, you try to believe what, what you hear uh, from the fans and, and getting feedback online, and, and a lot of people have come to agree. Uh, like, I remember reading one one guy. I was uh, I did this uh, internet radio show interview, and then we were we were getting questions coming in, and and I I was got to type in my answers and all that. And, um, one fan said, "Dude, Klaus, you absolutely suck." back in the day, but uh, I really uh, feel bad saying that to you now because you're about 
ten times better. You seem like a totally different person when I'm hearing you do play-by-play, -play. and this was after we did the uh, MTV show. So a lot of people, I will say, have, have kind of been saying that. That has been the general consensus, but whereas back in the day, uh, believe me, I got shit on a lot, and, uh, and you know, deservedly so, but uh, I just think I, I've improved in time, and I think there's always room for improvement, even now, you know, of course, and, you know, the day you stop thinking that you – can improve the day you, you start saying like, oh, I'm as good as I'm going to get. I don't need to improve is the day you uh, better check yourself and maybe even get out of the business because that's really the day you stop caring. So mm -hmm. I think even the best announcers, uh, Gordon Soley, Bill Mercer, Gorilla Monsoon, Joey Styles, I think guys like that were always trying to improve their game no matter how good we all thought they were, and that's really what kept them good, you know. So I believe me when I say it. I, I always have room for improvement, you know. Hold on a second. Is everybody still here? Yeah. yeah. Patrick? We are. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Now, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and maybe I can get these guys involved, is so when you're watching some of these announcers, it's clear to me when, when you can tell when they're legitimately excited and when they honestly couldn't care less about what they're calling, and it's becoming more and more obvious. Like Jim Ross, for example, who's one of the best of all time. I, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. You know, most of the time these days, though, he's not quite as good as he used to be, but that fire returns whenever he calls a CM Punk or a uh, John Morrison match. And you remember why you loved this guy back in the UWF? Yeah. I actually, I actually, um, I recall that match a couple weeks ago, right, on SmackDown. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a damn good match. I mean, I was actually, uh, I was sitting there with my girlfriend, and she really doesn't know too much about wrestling, you know, but just, she was sitting there going, Oh my gosh, this is so good. And I just, you know, when I hear her say that, I know, okay, this is, this is good. You know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, you can, you can kind of get a good idea of, of what's going on when a non fan kind of comments on something like that. And I remember, I, you know, it's funny you say that because I do remember JR kind of like, you, 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 you kind of sat up and you, oh, I'm noticing what JR is saying again. He's getting me into the match and, uh, and, and, and yeah, I think a lot of the time he's, I don't know, going through the motions. And that happens to all announcers, but sometimes you end up going through the motions. You, I don't know, it's a combination of getting burnt out, too. But uh, I remember that match. It was like I, I felt like I was watching old late 90s stuff, you know? Yep, exactly. and, and I was like, wow, uh, what's going on here? <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, all right, I want to ask you just a couple more questions, and we'll let you off the line. But um, you mentioned uh, – you know, the MTV show, and I'm assuming you were talking about Wrestling Society X. Yes, correct. Very good, very good. Now, you were associated with that. You were the announcer for that. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yes. Very good, very good. Now, I enjoyed uh, most of what I watched on that. And uh, <laughs> it's just an interesting thing, but I wanted to ask you, you know, everybody on this dais, I guess we'll call ourselves a dais, um, was saying that Eric Bischoff should stop doing things like the Hulk Hogan Celebrity Championship Wrestling and if he can get a seasonal show, even if it is seasonal, because the fire still burns inside of him if you read his blogs, and you can yeah. tell that he's clearly still got it if he went forward with it, do you think a seasonal-style wrestling show could work in this day and age, or do you think that because it would probably be pre-taped, it would just be so spoiled on the Internet that you would not, it wouldn't work? Well, that that's actually a problem we ran into with, with Wrestling Society X. We... uh you know, we taped months before because, like you said, it was a seasonal show. It was treated no different than any other sitcom or or, or reality show. You know, it was it was taped because uh, the network nowadays, unless you your unless you are your own private entity uh, aside from the network, you, you, that's what a show is going to be if a network is involved. Believe me uh, when I tell you, just working with MTV and the way it works, there's no way around it. You have to be a private entity like a TNA or an XPW or WWE, and you have to come in and already establish league into a network, you know, and basically have your own uh, production, and and that's the only way it works. And and unfortunately, the way networks work nowadays, it's going to be hard. Uh, they want to do like a Wrestling Society X. It benefits them because everything is in house, everything is taken care of, and, it, and the more and more corporate it gets, the more and more it's going to it's going to end up that way. And and again, just working at MTV, I seeing the inner mechanics on really how the whole thing worked, it's it's pretty impressive, but for the for the wrestling industry, it's it's I have to say it's 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 a dark future. But um 
Yeah, we, we had problems with that as far as seasonal. Uh, we had a lot of leaks. And not only that, but I, I always kind of was, was wondering when it was going on. I mean, I didn't have to worry about that because we only went one season. But uh, I always wondered, uh, well, what's going to happen now that we are – on MTV, once season one ends, we're going to have, like any other show, we're going to have a, a, a few weeks or maybe even a couple months of reruns. And then season two is going to eventually start, like any other show. So we were on the same night as ECW was, and that was an MTV decision. It had nothing to do with ECW being on Tuesday. They just happened to have that time slot open for that show. And that's with our luck, that's what happened. We got put up against the WWE product, you know, and that wasn't good for us. Even though our numbers were about the same as ECW's at the time, um, it was uh, it was probably uh, you know what, what did us in. But uh, uh, you know, it, it was it was one of those things where okay, let's say we were competing. You know, it wasn't our decision, but but nonetheless, we were competing with ECW. We were on the same time. Okay, week to week, we're, we're going to try to compete. We're going to try to have a better show, of course. But then, once our season ends, you know, we're not competing anymore. It's reruns. And then season two starts a, a couple months later. Then, okay, now we start competing again. So it just wouldn't have that longevity that you need in pro wrestling. It's like a soap opera cannot take uh, a season off. You know, uh, uh, Seinfeld, or uh, dating myself, but, you know, uh, Two and a Half Men, when that show goes off, there's reruns. You know, and then it comes back, whereas um, you can't do that with a soap opera and you can't do that with pro wrestling. So that's the only bad thing about getting into a, a network-run wrestling sh TV show or company. Yeah. You know, and, that, and again, that was the problem we ran into. Uh, once again, we didn't have to because we only went one season, but had we won another season, we would have ran, run into that problem. And, and there's a whole long story about us not going uh, another season, by the way. I don't know if we have enough. Sure, but sure. You know, go for it. Well, I mean, I mean, of course, there was um, there our, our ratings weren't the best, you know, but but uh, the whole net, the whole network MTV at the time wanted to go a new direction. Basically, uh, they wanted to get away from all the teeny bopper, uh, teenage girl, sweet sixteen, uh, hills uh, reality stuff, and they wanted to get because basically uh, at the time, talking with the execs, MTV basically lost their male audience, the whole jackass audience, uh, um, um, uh, celebrity deathmatch, all that stuff was gone. So our show was actually an attempt, uh, and then they brought in another show called Scarred uh, mm -hmm. and some other shows to, to get back that male audience. Halfway through our season, uh, management was changed at MTV, and they went right back to the whole reality kind of teeny bopper stuff on MTV. And and that was a big reason why we didn't get re-signed, because before our season even ended, before our last show even aired on MTV, they decided to pull the plug. Um, and they, they had already agreed to, to sign us for at least two seasons, no matter what the rate, because you, al you always have to give a new show a chance. It's always going to be bad ratings in the beginning. Uh, but not to say whether you're a fan of the show, whether you're not a fan of the show, that's really what happened on the inner workings. Unfortunately, the guys that were totally on board with WSX uh, management, and they were gone from the company. This was right in the middle of our season, like when episode four or five was airing. The whole company was revamped, and it, boom, went right. I mean, you see the shows that are on MTV now. It's, a, you know, uh, uh, Next and all that. It, it basically just reverted back to that, you know. So so that was, that was a big reason as to why um, we just never got the longevity we needed to get started. Uh, as as a company, but again, we would have run into those seasonal problems, which which at the time I couldn't rack my brain. Like, how in the world is this going to work? Not knowing that we got canceled, like, how is this going to work for season two, season three? I just don't get it, you know. Yeah. So so I, I think with the whole Bishop thing, that that's a great idea, but it, it just it just has to be carefully run a, a, a wrestling company. I think that's why he's going for these reality shows because he doesn't really have to worry about a continuing storyline just, boom, stopping because the season ends. You know, you just you just can't do that in pro wrestling. Absolutely. Well, we're going to let you go in just a sec, but I did want to ask you the last question. I'm sure you get asked this a lot. Joey Styles had the oh, my God, and anytime anything extreme happened in XPW, which was most matches. <laughs> um, 
we got the the I don't know what you'd call it the primal scream out of you I'll call it. Um, no, no, I, I think I think that's when uh, if someone someone joked around and that's they said it was it reminded them if if Archie Bunker was having rough and and uh, and and uh, uh, underground bonded sex with Edith Bunker that's how she would scream. <laughs> <laughs> that's wow. what somebody told. That's what somebody told me once, and I will never forget it. I'm like, wow, how the hell this this sick mind came up with that? I don't know, but I'm going to run with it. I got to know who said I that. I got to know who said that. Hey, you know what? That was that was just at a, at one of our LA Sports Arena shows, and we were just you know some of the fans were just coming up to us at the broadcast table. Hey, yeah, yeah, you sound like Edith Bunker when Archie Bunker's having like. Demonic sex with her. I'm like, oh, what the hell, man? So yeah, that was uh, funny. <laughs> oh man. All right, man. Well, I'll let you go in just a second. I mean, of course, we can ask you a thousand questions about things like the the XPW girls because obviously some of those their their yeah. reputation far out you know, stretches uh, wrestling. But uh, <laughs> that we'll save that for okay. another time. But again, we got this Saturday afternoon in LA, and they can check out the XPW dot com to find out more information about that. Correct. That's right, the T H E X P W dot com, and it's uh, again this Saturday afternoon, August twenty second, and that's going to be at a place called "quote unquote" the Arena. The address is sixty six fifty five Santa Monica Boulevard, two blocks east of Highland. Uh, the pre show starts at one thirty p.m. and doors open at one o'clock. There will be alcohol served, so. Uh, Get your game face on, fans, and we are looking forward to seeing you at XPWX, Roman numeral X, XPW10, 10-year anniversary celebration again Saturday afternoon, August 22nd, 6655 Santa Monica Boulevard, uh, 1 p.m. doors open. We will see you there, fans. Thank you, James, and all you guys, uh, the silent majority back there. Thank you, too, for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. It was, great having, it was great having you on, man. Anytime you want to come back on, you're welcome. And uh, congratulations on 10 years, man. It's been a great uh, ride for, for XPW fans. And I, I wish you the best of luck this Saturday, and I look forward to hearing how it comes out. All right, man. And, and you guys keep doing a good job. You guys, your guys' show is awesome, man. Keep doing a good job, man. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Have a, have a great night, and we will talk to you uh, soon, soon, hopefully, and we'll find out how it turned out. All right. Take care, guys. Thank Take you. Care. Bye-bye. All right, guys, that was Chris Class here on the interactive interview at WrestlingEpicenter.com and Block Talk Radio. And uh, that was actually a very fun interview. I like that guy. By the way, for those who don't know what his his primal scream sounds like, you got to pick up some of the XPWs because I wouldn't be able to do, do it justice. But it's something like... It's, uh, it, it's interesting, which, by the way, the Edith Bunker thing did, did pop into my head. And Is now, there an all-in-the-family sex tape? flying around somewhere because I'm trying to figure out how somebody would get that sound effect. Well, you got to remember the XPW crowd, and and let me let me say this: the XPW crowd wasn't your average group of people. Word. I mean, what's that again? Word. This is Interactive Wrestling Radio. 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 Featuring the interactive interview. Interactive interview. Interactive interview. Interactive interview. Interactive interview. Interactive interview. Oh yeah. Formerly the Blaze. 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 On WrestlingEpicenter.com. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. The Wrestling Epicenter. Don't get off. And now we shamelessly name drop from our history. The Wrestling Epicenter would like to apologize for the following. All right, everybody. Arriba la raza. Arriba la raza. Hey, y'all. Hello, ladies. Hey guys, we had a lovely conversation. First lady, absolutely. Oh, look at me. She's so kooky. <laughs> Be there. Where else? Interactive wrestling radio. Wrestling. Oh my god.
In the land of extreme, Don't forget to like and subscribe.